Knox Presbyterian Church, Rev. Mavis Curry, Director of Music, Martin Anderla, Sunday, March 7, 2021, Sermon Title, Stolen, Part 3, Communion Sunday. I'd like to welcome you to Knox Presbyterian Church in St. Thomas's online worship service and here to our sanctuary on this, the third Sunday of Lent. Just a few announcements before we begin. Firstly, a big thank you to Chuck and Shirley Paul. They have made a donation sponsoring today's online service and we're grateful for Chuck and Shirley's uh, long time membership at our church and for their friendship uh, through the years and for today's donation sponsoring our service. I would be remiss if I didn't wish Randy Mills a happy belated birthday. His birthday was yesterday and there was a drive-by parade uh, wishing Randy a happy 65th. And we're grateful also for Randy and, and for Zoe and all the two of them do as pastoral visitors at our church. A reminder of our Zoom Bible study this coming Wednesday, and if you would like to be a part of that, drop me a line and I will send you the information on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, the passage we'll be studying as well as the Zoom link. It's been a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on scripture together. Next Sunday is our annual meeting, and it will be a first at Knox. We'll be having our annual meeting virtually, and if you would like the Zoom link to be able to attend that meeting, uh, please contact the church, and we'll be in touch with you uh, in the next few days. Uh, the meeting begins just shortly after our morning worship service at 11.30, March 14th. In a couple of weeks time, we'll be opening our spring sale. Following in the tradition of our Christmas marketplace, it will be all online. And so in the next few weeks, uh, we'll be asking for donations of plants and some other new spring items, not uh, used spring items, just new ones uh, to do that fundraiser for our church. Now, you should have received your annual report this past week, along with uh, our congregational devotional and newsletter. Uh, if you didn't receive those items, please contact the church and we'll make sure you receive them soon. Today, we'll be celebrating communion. It's been our tradition on the first Sunday in March to break bread and share the cup together. During these online services, that means if you forgot, you need to run to your kitchen during the prelude and grab a piece of bread and pour yourself a glass of juice. I think these virtual communions, there is a lot of grace extended. We've seen our children use orange juice and Timbits and People pour fine glasses of red wine and raisin toast. So uh, be creative, and I hope that uh, today as we celebrate communion, you'll be mindful of your brothers and sisters in Christ uh, around our city, around the country and the globe who are sharing this sacrament with you today. Our prelude this morning is a composition of Martin's and Martin's wife Stella has paired this 
piece of music with images from a small island off the northwest coast of France. The island is called Mont Saint-Michel, and it's a commune, a small island, just about uh, a kilometer from the shore of France. In low tide, pilgrims were able to walk to the island where there's an abbey to pray and to reflect. Today, we look at these images of this place across the ocean, and we remember that we are a part of a family that extends beyond the walls of our church building, even around the globe. Let's prepare our hearts for worship.
During the season of Lent, our youth have been leading us in the call to worship. And we've been extinguishing the candles on our communion table, one candle each Sunday as we move towards Good Friday. Today, our reader is Sophie. Sophie is a, a grade eight student here in St. Thomas, and she is reading from her home this call to worship. You'll note that behind her is a needlepoint of the Lord's Supper. An interesting fact, the family moved that picture just for today's reading. And when they moved it, they wrote, noted that on the back that Luella Martin, Sophie's great-grandmother, who is the one who crafted the needlepoint, had written the date that she had started and the date that she'd completed that work. It took her an entire year, an exercise in faith, and a picture that her family treasures still. So let's listen to our call to worship liturgy as it is read by Sophie. There is so much during the day that clamors for our attention. We are bombarded with sound from the clock that awakens us to the telephone, the radio, the television, the conversations that we have or overhear. Where is the time and place to listen for the still, small voice of God? Listen now on this third Sunday in Lent. There is a place of quiet rest, and it is the place where God dwells within us. In Lent we journey to the parts of ourselves, not only to God, beneath the clamor. Let the story of Jesus reach us there. As we extinguish this light, we acknowledge the darkness and pain that has been committed against our planet. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, Sunday after Sunday, we extinguish these candles. We are mindful of the dark places in our world and in each one of our hearts. We confess today that we have treated your creation as if it was our own. We have acted without thinking. We have not been good stewards. Forgive us today, O oh God. May your light shine in each one of our hearts so that our actions in the week ahead might reflect the goodness of your Son, the one who taught us when we pray together to also say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn is All Who Hunger Gather Gladly. Let's sing together.
Well, for our children's times during these uh, online services, we've had a variety of things. Sometimes we have uh, seen artwork. Sometimes we've listened to music from our young people or hear, heard them lead us in uh, educational components. And sometimes we invite our children to bring forward a question. Today, Ellie has a question a faith question, and uh, we invite her to bring that question now. Hi, my name is Elliot. I'm a grade two student. I wonder how, how they put the juice in the tiny glass. Great question, Ellie, and great to see your face again. Ellie's question is, how do they get the juice in those tiny little communion cups that we usually uh, hand out for communion when we're gathered here in our sanctuary? An excellent question. Well, I need to tell you, Ellie, in fact, the church has only used those tiny little cups for about the last 120 years. Before then, most churches just used the one giant cup and people shared it. Often people would come forward to take communion. Sometimes they would dip the bread into the cup. Other times they would drink from the cup itself and the minister would just wipe off the glass and pass it to the next person. But around 1900, people began to think that was probably not very good hygiene. We might be passing around a few different viruses and bugs. And so churches began to use those tiny little glasses. In our own congregation, about 20 years ago or so, it was decided that we would use disposable cups. And so those little glasses that we use at communion are actually disposable. And again, that decision was made in order to keep our congregation safe and healthy. It was hard to clean all those tiny little glass cups. But how do they get the juice into that, those cups? Well, I need to tell you, I am not the person that does that. That is the job of our elders. And on the day before communion, they gather in the Knox kitchen in order to fill the cups and cut the bread. So we're going to go downstairs to the Knox kitchen and listen to Pam O'Sullivan and Wendy Liebritz, their sisters, and uh, they're going to tell us a little bit about the secret of how grape juice gets into communion cups. Pam and Wendy. Hi, Ellie. Well, we start with Welch's grape juice because we really can't serve wine. And we put it in this container here. This is what we serve with the plastic glasses. They're more hygienic than the glass. And we pour it in, and then <laughs> there's a red button. I push that down, and it goes into the little glass. Just like that. Easy peasy. Hi, Ellie. For the bread, we just use regular bread. We cut off the crusts. So it looks pretty nice, so you don't get brown pieces. Cut that all off, and then we just make nice little squares. Sometimes we use an electric knife, which goes a lot faster. But this is how we do it, and then we just like that, and put it in the dish. We usually have a nice cloth on there, but today we don't. And there you go. Well, thank you, Pam and Wendy, for that answer. Of course, we need to know that it doesn't matter so much what the elements are that we're eating. It's our hearts as we come to communion that God really cares about. And so this morning, you may not have perfect white Wonder Bread or Welch's grape juice, we need to know that those are elements that are for us, and they're not elements for God. And so wherever you are, whatever you have forward as we eat together in a few minutes' time, let's be mindful that this is a celebration.
that this, these foods were set aside as a time for us to just remember that we are part of the family of God. Now, let's listen to our first scripture lesson. It's a reading from the prophecy of Isaiah, and our reader is Scott Martin. This is the word of God from Isaiah 43. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring you offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Thank you, Scott, for sharing that reading with us today. During this season of Lent, we've been focusing on the theme, Stolen, looking at passages of scripture where people have something stolen from them, when God steals something from others, or something is stolen from God himself. This morning, we're thinking about stolen time. In the midst of a busy week, in the midst of a lot of chaos, Jesus and his disciples steal away to an upper room. So let's listen together to the word of God as it is found in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, and so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have he eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that one who betrays him. And they began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. We thank God for this reading from his word. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, may this message be in the name of the Father and for the sake of the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, our household has been no different than yours, I imagine. Over the last year, uh, we've watched more movies on Netflix than I think I ever had before. 
Early in the pandemic, like many others, we watched Contagion. Then we moved into a few series. We watched the entire series of Hunger Games movies. And now we're stretching ourselves. We've moved further afield. This past week, we watched a movie entitled A Man Called Ove. It's a Swedish film based on a Swedish book, which I'd read earlier last year, a book by Frederick Backman. And some of you may have read his books yourself, his books as well. In any case, A Man Called Ove is a wonderful little film. It has subtitles in English, and it features the life story of a man called Ove. At the start of the movie, you can't help but dislike Ove. He's 59 and he is grumpy. He seems to find a problem with everything. Every single thing in his life he is upset about. And he's not afraid to tell the store clerk or his neighbor what's wrong with them. It's not too far into the movie that you realize that, in fact, Ove is not just a miserable person. In fact, he's grieving. His wife had passed away six months before, and unbeknownst to the world outside, Ove was struggling. He was planning to end his own life. He so wanted to see his wife again. The movie is funny. Every time Ove creates a plan to end his life, it appears that he is interrupted by someone. He has several different plans, but every one of them is foiled, often by his new neighbor, an Iranian woman called Parvane. She's about eight months pregnant. She has two little children and a husband who seems to be a little bit incompetent. And she is forever knocking on Ove's door, needing help. In fact, it's Parvane that ends up saving Ove. She ends up learning how to drive, thanks to Ove, her neighbor. There's a particularly beautiful scene in the film. Ove invites Parvane into a cafe, and he's still grumpy and a curmudgeon, and he, he ushers her into the cafe, and she attempts to sit at one table, and he insists, no, they have to eat at this particular table. And the waiter comes with a menu, and Ove says, no, we do not need a menu here. We will have the Napoleon slice and a cup of coffee, both of us. Doesn't mind matter what Parvene wants, that's what they'll be eating. And it's only as you see Ove dip his fork into his dessert, it's only then that you realize that that cafe was the place where Ove and Sonia, his wife, used to always go every week. And every week they would sit at that particular table, and every week they would eat a Napoleon slice and drink a cup of coffee. And in that moment when Ove and his neighbor Parvene, this great with child young woman, are sitting in this cafe, you can see in that moment that Ove is transported back, back to when his wife was with him. And he is reminded just in that moment of the person he loved and of that person who loved him also. It's almost in that moment that we see Ove change it's as if he sees himself the way Sonia always looked at him, through the lens of love. I know that it's been a year since you and I have shared communion in the sanctuary together. And I know that celebrating communion in our own homes is not the same. It feels different. It tastes 
different. Nevertheless, we are invited to gather at the table of Christ today. I think that Jesus made time, stole those few hours with his disciples during that busy week because he knew there would be times that they would feel alone. He knew that there would be times that they would be grief-stricken. He knew that there would be times when they would have questions and feel lost. I think he stole those couple of hours with them to give them a gift, a gift of something that they could repeat, sort of the way Ove repeated his time around the cafe table. I think Jesus gave us the Lord's Supper so that he, we would remember the one who loves us. And so that we could see ourselves once again through the eyes of that one, through the eyes of Jesus. And so today we hear again that old story about the friends of Jesus gathered around a table, imperfect people, people that had strong faith and people whose faith was wavering. We hear again that story of people who were tired, people who were afraid, and how Jesus set aside that time to be with them. As we move to the Lord's table today, may we remember the one who loves us. And may we see ourselves through the eyes of our Savior. So come to this table, you who have much faith and you who feel as if your faith is almost gone. Come, you who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come, young and old, rich and poor. This is the Lord's table. And whether we're drinking fine red wine and unleavened bread, or whether we just have a hot cup of coffee in our hands, may we remember this story. May we remember the one who loves us. Our communion hymn today is An Upper Room Did Our Lord Prepare. And the images that accompany this hymn are images of famous artists, Artists who have tried to convey the upper room uh, through various mediums. I wanted to draw your attention particularly to the artist who's featured at the beginning and at the end of this hymn. He's a contemporary artist. He's from the Netherlands. His name is Jan van Toff. He started a website. It's called Gospel Images. Jan van Toff, he was a uh, artist all his life, a professional artist. And in these later years of his life, he's begun a project wanting to share his faith through art. And so he's slowly working through scripture, painting scripture. I emailed Jan van Toff a, a week or two ago. I discovered his website, and I asked him for permission to use his paintings in our services and he so graciously agreed. And so let's sing together. We'll sing the first verse of an upper room did our Lord prepare. And then following communion, we'll sing the last verses. On this communion Sunday, wherever we are, let's breathe in deeply and know that 
we are beloved children of God. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, in this season of shadows, we remember that you came as light to the world. We remember that you are the God who pulled light out of darkness. That you are the one who pointed the way to your people when they were in the blackness of slavery. When they felt alone. When they walked through the valley of the shadow of grief. Lord God, we give you thanks for Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and for your invitation to all of us to be lights to one another. Wherever we are, O oh God, we pray that this might be a time of sacrament, a sacred time, that you might speak in the stillness to each one of us, that you might knit us together across the miles until we are able again to celebrate communion in this sanctuary. Holy God, hear our prayers, for we bring them in the great name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after the supper, he took the cup. And having poured it out, He said, this cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. As often as you drink it, remember me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see, the Lord is good. Now, as we share communion in our own homes, let's listen together to Marianne McVicker singing In Christ Alone.
Let us pray. Holy God, there is so much in our faith that we do not understand. There is so much mystery. And yet we rest in that mystery. Knowing that you are the one who made us and you are the one who loves us. In the week ahead, may we be mindful that you are a God who is with us. Whenever we break bread, may we think of your meal with the disciples. Whenever we raise a glass, may we think of our brothers and sisters in Christ, both those from this congregation and all around the world. Holy God, bless each one of us today and in the days ahead so that we may be light. For we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Now let's sing together the last verses of an upper room did our Lord prepare.
And now let us go in peace and may the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain and abide with each of you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Now it's time for the last word. See you next week, Knox. Hey, Knox, isn't it a gorgeous day? Love the snow, love the winter. I love being shut in. Life is good. Hello there. Happy to see everyone. Be seeing there at the church soon. Hi, Knox. Hello, Knox. Have a wonderful week. <laughs> Have a great week, Knox. <laughs> good luck. <laughs>